But if you want to make the world a better place, do exactly what David did. Even when you know somebody's out to get you, even when you know somebody is an enemy that is knocking at your door that would love nothing more than to tear you down, show them respect even when they don't deserve it and haven't earned it. And show them that you mean them no harm. I believe if more Christians did this on a frequent basis and, and took the David position, that we'd have a lot more Christians in this country. Hey, fellow tacticians. Be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report comes from the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to be continuing our series in 1 Samuel. So uh, you may remember the last time that we were reading through the passage that David snuck into the cave and cut off a piece of Saul's robe. And then on his way back from having that piece of Saul's robe in his hand, he started feeling actually kind of bad about it. He said, this is something that was dishonorable for me to do to the Lord's anointed, and I need to go and return this piece of robe. So we're going to go ahead and read that passage right now. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 24, verses 8 through 11. Afterward, however, David got up and went out of the cave and called after Saul, saying, My lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the ground and prostrated himself. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David is seeking to harm you? Behold, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord had handed you over to me today in the cave. And someone said to kill you, but I spared you. And I said, I will not reach out with my hand against my Lord, because he is the Lord's anointed. So my father, look, indeed, look at the edge of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the edge of your robe, but did not kill you, Know and understand that there is no evil or rebellion in my hands, and I have not sinned against you, though you are lying in wait for my life to take it. One thing that's really interesting about this, this is actually the very first episode where David and Saul speak frankly to one another. Because there has been this tension, and David and Saul have both known for a while that Saul was trying to kill David, or at the very least trying to have someone else kill him. But it's always kind of been under the radar. It's always been something that's kind of unspoken. I mean, granted, when a person throws a spear at you twice and barely misses, I mean, everyone kind of knows at that point. But still, this is the first time, at least that we know of in the scripture, where they just speak openly about this and don't pretend as though that's not something that Saul has been plotting underneath the surface this whole time. And it's interesting that when that conversation happens, it's because David actually has the upper hand. He has not only the actual advantage in the sense that he could have killed Saul, even though he chose not to, but he also had the moral high ground. And that's important here. What happens here with David is he behaves as though this man is still the king, still has God's favor, even though he would probably be justified in not doing so. Don't you think David could have probably gotten away with saying, well, this guy is my enemy, whether he's the Lord's anointed or not, and he's trying to take my life, and so I'm going to treat him that way. And I think he also would have been justified in saying, well, you know, Samuel anointed me. I'm the real king of Israel, and Saul's not. And so really, Saul should be the one prostrating himself to me and, and paying me fealty and pledging his loyalty to me rather than the other way around. I don't think that either one of those, honestly, would have been unreasonable or even sinful. But David didn't do that. Because whether or not it was sinful or whether or not he could have 
gotten away with doing either of those two things. It wasn't about doing the bare minimum or doing what was acceptable to God. It was about doing what was right before God. You see, three times there, David goes out of his way to show submission to his king. And ultimately, that submission is not submission to Saul as a man, but as a king that God anointed. And you see that in that latter verse. You see that he bowed his head to the floor and prostrated himself. You see that he called him my Lord. And then you also see later he says, Father, giving him the title of an authority figure. And that's even more important when you consider in their culture, Father was something that was revered much more, and, and we, they had a different kind of relationship with how they saw the Father at the time. And I don't just mean Father in the sense of the Heavenly Father. I mean just fa earthly fathers had a different kind of relationship with their sons than 21st century Americans do. Whether it's good or bad or not, they just did. And so three occasions there, you see David actually reaching out and literally, the, the literal sense of the word, humiliating himself to show deference to this person who is trying to kill him. So when Jesus says much later, and remember Jesus is the descendant of David, when Jesus says about a thousand years after this, to love your enemies, David believed it and was living it. This is a person that's trying to kill him and has every reason for David to hate him, and he chooses not to. And remember, that father that he gave at the end of that, that's not just a fancy title that he's giving to him because he's the king. He's also literally his father-in-law. Remember that McCall married David, so Saul's daughter is David's wife, and so he is his son-in-law. So when he calls him father, there's actually a relationship there. And so all of these things he says that he does because he acknowledges that Saul is the Lord's anointed. Maybe he doesn't have God's favor anymore. Maybe God has chosen David to be king over Saul. And by the way, he has. We know that from Scripture. And yet, despite all this, David goes out of his way to show Saul, Saul, you and I have no quarrel. I'm not trying to take your life. Why are you listening to these people that are saying that I'm coming after you or that I'm sort of imagining some kind of ill. If I wanted to kill you, I would have done it today, and I didn't. So knock it off. Quit listening to these things and feeding the crazy voices in your head that I'm coming after you. I, I'm not rebelling against you. I have no animosity towards you. In fact, I could have taken your life. I had it handed to me on a silver platter by God himself, would have been perfectly justified in killing you, and I didn't want to because it was the wrong thing to do. Actually, it wouldn't even have necessarily been the wrong thing to do since God delivered him to him. But David chose not to anyway because he wanted to do what was not just acceptable, but what was right, what was best what God would have ideally wanted him to do. And I think that that speaks to us. You see, David is expressing dual loyalties here. He's expressing loyalty to his king, but he's only expressing loyalty to that king ultimately because he recognizes that authority was handed to him by God. And as modern-day Christians, sometimes we have to do exactly the same thing. When it comes to elders, for example, in the church, I don't agree with everything my elders have done. There's some times where I've voiced my opinions to them, and, and I was very much against the decision that they reached. But at the end of the day, I realized that the authority that they have does come directly from God, and I am honor-bound to obey and, and to acknowledge that. Now, if they start doing something that is against God or against the Scripture, then I actually have a responsibility to do the opposite. If i got to choose between obeying my elders and obeying God, i got to obey God. But if obeying my elders, even though I don't necessarily want to, would still be in accordance to God's word, they're not doing anything that's unscriptural, then I do have an obligation as a Christian and a member of the church that they oversee to listen to them. And, and that is true in many other relationships, the, the father-son relationship, the spousal relationship, the relationship even of uh, bosses, political leaders, that kind of thing. We could go on and on and flesh all that out, but ultimately what's going on here is that David sees his loyalty to Saul as an extension of his loyalty to God. Now, that doesn't mean he sits there and, and lets Saul violate God's law and murder him. 
I mean, that that would also be a violation of listening to God. But David sees this loyalty, sees this deference as something that God would want, because at one time, at least, this person was anointed by God to be Israel's king, and that meant they were David's king as well. And he understood that and recognized it, and he tried to show Saul. He begged and pleaded with him, Saul, knock it off. I'm not trying to hurt you. I don't want to hurt you. Please quit pursuing me. And you see that really at the very end. And he says, even though I know you're lying in wait for me, I know you're trying to take my life, I'm still not going to raise my blade against you. And I want you to think about this from both sides. Think about it from Saul's perspective and from David's perspective, because I think we've all been both at one point in our life. I think it's almost inevitable that sometimes we have imagined somebody was an enemy when they really weren't. Or even if they were an enemy, we thought that they were after us or they were out to get us, and it turned out at least at this one particular instance, they happened to not be. That happens. Sometimes we perceive things that aren't necessarily true or we were missing some crucial bit of information that would have helped us understand that this person meant no harm. Now, normally it doesn't come in the case of someone trying to murder us, but granted, we've all been in that situation where we thought somebody was was out to get us and then it turns out, oh, they actually didn't mean that thing. I, I thought they were trying to insult me. It turns out they weren't or they didn't actually mean it that way, that sort of thing. So that happens to us all the time. So from Saul's perspective, regardless of how Saul reacts here, and we'll go over that in the next lesson, but regardless of Saul, how Saul reacts, he has an opportunity here to do the right thing by God and acknowledge that the person that is saying what they are really didn't mean harm. And it's always better to ascribe some kind of ignorance or incompetence over immorality or malice. In this case, I don't even think Saul has a case for the lower version of that. But in our cases and in our daily lives, it's always best for us to remember that the other person probably isn't out to get us. And we shouldn't assume that unless we have really good reason to think that that is the case. But then, and this is more important, think about it from David's perspective. Because I think what David does here is significantly harder. David is in the position of having somebody that he knows is out to get him. I mean, he, th there's not a higher out to get you than a guy coming after you with his army. I mean, it's very clear what Saul's intentions are here. And he's already tried to kill him before this several times earlier. So th there's no confusion, and David's speech actually speaks to this, there's no confusion about what's going on here or what Saul wants. And David takes the position of, Yes, I know he's trying to do evil towards me. It doesn't matter. I'm going to choose to good, do good towards him anyway. You cannot defeat evil with good. Or you cannot defeat evil with more evil. You have to defeat evil with good. Ooh, I almost messed up there. You have to counter hatred with love. Because if you're, the answer to their hatred is you hating them, you're just going to breed more hatred and you're both going to get caught in a downward spiral. That's not going to end well. As Jordan Peterson would say, that is not good. When it comes down to a situation like this, where we know we've been wronged, where we know that the other person was out to get us, they showed malice, I want you to notice how strong a person it takes in the character of David to forgive that person and to show them grace, which is unmerited favor, favor that they did not earn. Saul definitely did not deserve this good treatment from David not only extended to the fact that he spared his life, but that on top of that, he also showed him respect and reverence and tried to go out of his way to bury the hatchet and create peace. Be that person. That's what I'm asking. You want to make the world a better place? We've talked a lot tonight about how scary it's getting out there, and it is. But if you want to make the world a better place, do exactly what David did. Even when you know somebody's out to get you, even when you know somebody is an enemy that is knocking at your door that would love nothing more, than to tear you down, show them respect even when they don't deserve it and haven't earned it, and show them that you mean them no harm. I believe if more Christians did this on a frequent basis and, and took the David position, that we'd have a lot more Christians in this country. Because it's hard not to be drawn into that. 
to somebody that you know you've wronged, that you know you have done everything in your power to tear them down and they still love you and they still want to do right by you and they still don't want to do to you what you want to do to them, it's hard not to change your mind when confronted with something like that. And the reason that is the case is because that's the love of Christ. David doesn't always show the love of Christ. Don't get me wrong. He's still a flawed human being, and he makes several mistakes later on in the same book. But right here, that's about as close a correlation to Christ's love in the Old Testament that you're going to find. Loves his enemy so much that he shows respect and deference for them and shows them that he loves them and still wants what's best for him. While he's trying to kill him, I mean, that's an echo of the cross right there. And the best thing that we can do for this world is to also echo that cross. That even our enemies look at us and are impressed by our morality, even if they don't understand it like Saul didn't. Remind people of the ideal version of themselves. Give them that opportunity. David is essentially saying to Saul here, Saul, this could be you. You could be a great king. You could be somebody that has a life full of love and joy and contentment if you just did what God asked you to do and quit going after people that you're so terrified of losing your own power, you're willing to rip your own family apart to preserve it. David, in a sense, is reminding him of who Saul used to be and who he could be again. And sometimes that's exactly the same reminder that we need for ourselves. We need to have somebody to stand there and remind us of the ideal version of ourselves, the God-given talent and potential that he put in us if we'll just listen to him and follow his word. And sometimes we need to be the person that brings that message to somebody that isn't living up to that potential. And I genuinely believe if more Christians were better at this, it would solve a great deal, maybe not all, but an awful lot of the world's problems, and that's something worth thinking about. Stay the course, friends. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow sun of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.